Domestic water that's provided to our homes today you know, comes through a series of water treatment processes and piping and pumps and you know, things that bring that water to us today. And then the wastewater is returned back to treatment, uh, to treatment plants. A couple of challenges those municipalities are facing. One is that the infrastructure is aging, it's leaking. Uh, there's you know, between a lot of cities have between 30 and 60 percent of the water that they produce never makes it to the end of the line because it leaks out of these pipes. It's difficult for them to replace it because there just isn't the reserve, the revenue to be able to, to invest in, in this in, uh, replacement. Uh, one of the other challenges is it's very energy intensive. Uh, between 3 and 20 percent of a typical municipality's budget goes to energy to produce and pump this water around. So we look at smart grid type of technology, not unlike we see in the, the energy smart grid, uh, is necessary for water to really uh, to, to improve this system. Part of that is to be able to detect where are these leaks, to be able to be predictive to get out ahead. So instead of waiting for a leak to occur and having the, you know, all of the, the emergency uh, digging up the roads, you know, all the, the problems that that might cause, it would be nice to be able to predict when might that failure occur, to be able to predict what are the costs over the next year or the next decade in that, uh, that infrastructure. Uh, we as consumers, if we really understood where our water was, was going and we had some control over that and we could you know, use the water in off-peak hours, all of the same type of things that we try to do with the energy grid, I think it would really improve our overall consumptive habits of water. Uh, another thing is that there, the water pricing structure is uh, it's a real challenge for us today. Many parts of the world, including many parts of the United States, basically water is free. And so as long as water is free or highly subsidized, there's really, there's, there's kind of no incentive for us to reduce our consumption or change our behaviors. So I think a smart system would give us that insight that we need to really change behaviors. Because I do think people want to, uh, want to be smart consumers of our water, but without that information, it's very difficult to make those, those smart decisions. There's a lot of uh, really smart technologies being deployed now in cities. Um, a couple of examples, uh, Singapore has been brilliant in the way that they're thinking about their kind of the overall uh, broad scope of their water system. Uh, for many years, uh, Singapore relied on Malaysia for the supply of their water, a giant pipeline coming from Malaysia to Singapore. And over the last decade or so, they've been very proactive in trying to diversify their water supply. So for instance, they now have a, a program they refer to as the Four Taps. They have four different ways that they get water. One is that pipeline from Malaysia. The second is through uh, very advanced reuse, water, wastewater reuse technologies that they've deployed so that a significant portion of their over water, overall water supply actually comes from treated uh, wastewater streams. Fantastic technology. The third is around the capture of, of rainwater. You know, a lot of rain in Singapore, but most of it runs off. So now what they've been able to do is build a series of reservoirs and catchment basins to catch and uh, purify that water. And then fourth, they use desalination technology to kind of make up the difference. So between these four various technologies, smart infrastructure system to monitor, uh, they really are, are kind of brilliant in the way they've put a long-term plan together around their water supply. The future really is uh, one of the major solutions for our future water challenge is going to be reuse of water. And you know, there's often a negative uh, connotation to that. People think, oh, toilet to tap, we've heard the flush to brush, uh, shower to flower, so a lot of different uh, thoughts. But uh, really the beauty of wastewater reuse is we can actually purify that wastewater way beyond uh, the quality needed for, for drinking water. And in fact, it's a nice, consistent, high quality water. You know, people don't have much issue with desalination to be able to take seawater and make drinking water, and actually wastewater is much easier to treat than, than seawater. But independent of that, that negative uh, reaction to wastewater reuse, if you think about it, 90% of the world's water is not used for human consumption you know, or for domestic use. So we've got a great opportunity to treat and reuse our wastewater for agricultural irrigation, for industrial uses, for a lot of other uses before we ever get to the point where we have to use it for you know, direct potable water reuse. So today we see a lot of adaptation of reuse water to take the load off of streams and rivers and freshwater supplies to be used in industrial plants. Another great area related to water reuse is this idea of waste to value. How you take a waste stream, don't look at that as a, as a liability anymore. There's a lot of goodies in, your, in wastewater, for instance. 
uh, in a municipal wastewater system, tremendous amount of carbon content, which you can convert to energy. So this idea of having a wastewater plant that is, that is carbon neutral or actually generates uh, you know, more power than it consumes, a tremendous opportunity. Uh, phosphorus is a dwindling resource globally, yet there's a lot of phosphorus in waste streams. So there's some cool technologies coming out that are going to be able to selectively remove things like phosphate or metals like copper from a waste stream and be able to process those into a finished product. So we need to stop thinking about a wastewater stream as, as pure waste and look at that as, a, as an asset. Not unlike we've been looking at, you know, if you think about recycled aluminum and plastic and all that used to be a pure waste stream, that's now raw material for, for other processes. So wastewater in the future will be a raw material for many processes. The price of water is a real, um, that's a hot topic. Uh, where, where we stand with the price of water is it needs to be priced relative to the value received from that water. Often where water is underpriced or not priced for value, there's no real incentive to reduce consumption or change behaviors. And so the most important thing I think relative to price is that it has to be priced according to the investments made to get that water to you. you know, people say water is a human right, and I completely agree. What is not necessarily a human right or free is that treatment and, uh, tr and transport of the water to get it conveniently to us. So I think the most important thing is that people realize the value of that water. You know, today our water bill in most parts of the world is much less than our cable bill, much less than our monthly uh, cell phone bill, and yet you could certainly live without those uh, long before you could live without water. So we, we, uh, we are encouraging the world to look more wisely at water pricing. And one of the challenges regarding price, for instance, is agriculture. Seventy percent of the world's water supply goes to our agricultural markets for irrigation. So if you think about it today, if we subsidize the price of water for irrigation, and there's really no desire on a, uh, you know, a farmer's part to spend a lot of money for low flow irrigation or smarter irrigation technologies because it, it really is a cost to them. Instead, if we would think of those subsidies for low flow irrigation, for smart technologies, uh, you know, net net, the farmer doesn't pay anymore, but we as a society have much more water available then for our own consumption. Mm -hmm.